Module 16 Relational Summary Lecture GEP2, Liberating Ecology. You have only to come to the Rosebud Continuum Eco Science Sustainability Center, where I live in Land O'Lakes, to see what we owe to the Marco Polo like visits I was able to make with National Geographic, the U.S. Embassy, and Solar Cities to the east, following the sun. We have three. Hushin Chinese biodigester dragons and several smaller digesters that I designed inspired by my visits to the near and far east on the property, turning all of our food and toilet waste into clean fuel and nutritious fertilizer and healthy food. We have inexpensive and efficient Chinese evacuated tube solar hot water systems and solar electric panels. We have the Japanese blessed plastic to oil machine which uses thermal depolymerization, pyrolysis, to turn much of our non-organic waste material the so-called impossible to recycle number seven plastics like used toothbrushes and dental floss and nutrition bar wrappers and chips bags into hurricane lamp fuel. And we have composting toilets similar to what Chinese farmers used to place by their farms to gather the much needed night soil, the one that closed the metabolic rift through soil creation. Our PCGS students from the East, many of whom come to us through the Into USF program, usually arrive already knowing a lot about these technologies and techniques, while our own U.S. foreign students find themselves hearing about these simple solutions for the first time, or believing they're too expensive or unavailable or somehow unpractical or inefficient. Often we have to counter the America first bluster by admitting that in many parameters, America has become akin to a developing country, with a small class of insanely wealthy people whose ecological footprint is huge and who have an insatiable appetite for cradle-to-grave resources, with a shrinking middle class that spends its life trying to keep up with these polluting Joneses, and a burgeoning poor who live the consequences of environmental injustice without adequate health care or infrastructure alternatives. Students from places that had disparagingly been called third world countries, and at the time even shithole countries, who are now beginning to implement green technologies with gusto and even take the shit from the hole and literally turn it into fuel and fertilizer and healthy food again, find themselves shocked to find how backwards and ignorant the richest and most powerful nation on earth seems to have remained by and large. The classic complaint we hear is, isn't Florida supposed to be the sunshine state? Well, how come there's so little going on here? And how come state officials were not allowed to use the words climate change and the majority here think it's a hoax? Politics, as usual. Meanwhile, on my trips throughout India with the India Youth Climate Network, through Nepal with National Geographic and through China with Intu and Solar Cities, I saw that somewhere on this great planet, we literally have all the drawdown solutions we need to mitigate and adapt to climate disruption from solar powered and heated skyscrapers I saw in new cities in China to dedicated tree lined bike and electric vehicle lanes in Shanghai and Shenzhen and green belts along highways and bullet train railways everywhere in between. And these modules invited you to explore how it's only politics that stands between us and full adoption of green technology. This course has been a gateway, an entry ticket to the very real and powerful drawdown solutions that truly can end the threat of global warming. And not just end it. The title of our primary text, remember, is Drawdown, the most comprehensive plan ever proposed to reverse global warming. Reverse global warming. And we're not just talking about stopping the planet from heating up. We're talking about cooling it down to the Holocene averages that made Homo sapiens and the other apes and monkeys and polar bears and pandas and dogs and cats and canaries flourish before we brought them in the coal mine and brought what was in the coal mines and oil wells out to them. And now we know that this can be done by switching to renewable energy, by establishing true solar cities, and primarily by reestablishing the forest and wetland and coral and kelp and soil ecosystems that once covered our planet with ever co-evolving co life. This book is the 100 most substantive solutions to reverse global warming based on meticulous research by learning scientists and policymakers around the world. It says, in the face of widespread fear and apathy, an international coalition of researchers, professionals, and scientists has come together to offer a set of realistic and bold solutions to climate change. Our 100, tech, 100 techniques and practices are described here 
Some are well known, some you may never have heard of. They range from clean energy to educating girls in lower income countries to land use practices that pull carbon out of the air. The solutions exist, are economically viable, and communities throughout the world are currently enacting them with skill and determination. If deployed collectively on a global scale over the next 30 years, they represent a credible path forward and just not just to slow the Earth's warming, but to reach drawdown, that point in time when greenhouse gases in the atmosphere peak and begin to decline. These measures promise cascading benefits to human health, security, prosperity, and well-being, giving us every reason to see this planetary crisis as an opportunity to create a just and livable world. It is hoped now that you know that we all have all the solutions and technology and know-how necessary to do the necessary drawdown in time. And it's hoped that now that you know that, you won't waste any more time. It's demonstrable that the real barriers are not to be found in the economy, but in political economics. That the real problems aren't really problems with getting our ecologies right, but getting our political ecologies correct. That's why this course has been a door into the fields of political economy and political ecology. There are so many resources that you'll want to start exploring in these important fields. You'll want to get familiar with names like Anil Agarwal, the Indian editor of comprehensive volumes like Green Politics, and papers like, environmental, papers like The Environmentality Community, Intimate Government, and The Making of Environmental Subjects, and Enchantment and Disenchantment, The Role of Community in Natural Resource Conservation. And you'll also want to get to know Akimichi Ichikawa's Tonan Ajie no Morini Naninga Okete Irunoka, what is happening in the forests of Southeast Asia. See, so much of the literature comes out of the East that in effect you'll be like the Beatles when they first discovered great Eastern music and brought it to Western audiences through their own lens, taking something people have been doing and refining and enjoying on the other side of the planet for centuries and finding your own way to interpret and present it to the audiences you know. You'll encounter the works of scholars like Anthony Bevington and his writings in the journal World Development, writings like Capitals and Capabilities, a framework for analyzing peasant viability, rural livelihoods and poverty, and At the Boundaries of La Politica, Political Ecology, political, uh, political ecology Policy Networks and Moments of Government. And of course, you should get deep into the work of Piers Blakey, who I have the pleasure of meeting and taking lectures with. His 1985, The Political Economy of Soil Erosion, is, quote, widely considered to be a classic statement of the political ecology perspective. And then, naturally, you'll need to dive into the work of Arturo Escobar and Richard Pete and Michael Watts, especially through their 1996 classic edited volume, Liberation Ecologies, Environment, Development, and Social Movements and Liberation Ecology, Development, Sustainability, and Environment in an Age of Market Triumphalism. And you will want to do this deep dive into the literature because that's what you are part of. You are now part of a social movement in liberation ecology. Yep, that's what it's called, liberation ecology. Just as the liberation theology of the Global South sought and seeks to reclaim religion from those who would use it to divide or oppress, liberation ecology is about the reconciliation of natural and human cultures. Liberation ecology isn't about more regulations against the excesses of development and finding ways to bring down human population. And while those may be the salubrious consequences of it ultimately, it doesn't call for anything draconian. Liberation ecology is about finding a unity rather than a division between so-called man and nature. And most importantly, not seeking to repair nature through more oppression, dominance, or land management. That wouldn't be liberation. That would maintain nature's enslavement to human control rather than allowing for continued symbiosis. Allow me to contextualize and put this all together by quoting you from a 2016 article by Thomas Lindsay called We've Broken the Planet, A Case for Liberation Ecology and the Rights of Nature, showing how the liberation theology of the Global South and the liberation ecology of the East and South 
are now being applied in the global north and west. He writes about, quote, the rights of nature, liberation ecology, by saying, in the 1950s, a new strain of Catholicism arose against, dictate, uh, arose against dictatorial governments and severe poverty in Latin America. Called liberation theology, priests cast Jesus as a political figure and revolutionary who sought to free the poor from an oppressive governmental elite. Priests decentralized the practice of Christianity, transforming disenfranchised communities from being the object of church teaching to becoming direct interpreters of the Bible and designers of their own worship services. Liberation theology became a threat to the church by critiquing the economic and social structures on which the church structure relied. In response, the Vatican ordered purges of Catholic priests to suppress the doctrine, end quote. However, the idea of liberation movements applied to religion and environment began to take hold once people realized that rather than necessarily needing better regulation and control over bad actors who were abusing the religious and environmental institutions, which itself is a form of oppression, that is, we try to stifle and suppress bad behavior and injustices, assuming they're a constant in human nature that need to be put under better control, we really needed to set the rest of humanity free to do good and let that good overwhelm and crowd out the bad. Lindsay continues, the community rights movement emerging in the United States has much in common with the major themes of liberation theology in that it seeks to decentralize decision-making authority to marginalized communities and posits that the highest role of the law is the protection of human and natural communities rather than protection of the ruling elite. Its critique is much the same, that an unholy alliance of governmental and corporate elites prey on communities and people have no choice but to submit to fracking and other corporate projects, thus allowing the elite to expand their power over people and nature. The author says, while liberation ecology has been used in the past to describe the authority of human communities to serve as good stewards of the planet, it must go further. Towards an expansion of community lawmaking, which, which recognizes nature not as property to be well used and conserved by humans, but as possessing the highest rights protections capable of being afforded by our system of governance. Without a true liberation ecology activism in which community democratic authority is expanded to enable people to ban that which harms human and natural communities and to begin to construct a new system which affords those communities the highest protections of the law, dependence on the old order will guarantee the destruction of the planet continues." End quote. If you look at Pete and Watt's reader on liberation ecology, you'll notice it starts with these two compelling quotes that clearly express the humbling perspective this sub-discipline of political ecology encourages us to adopt. The first is the radical perspective of Marx from Capital Volume 1. Radical because, well, because it gets to the root of the problem, and because it echoes what the northern conquistadors and imperialists and colonizers found embedded in the philosophies of so many peoples they encountered as they traveled like a plague southward ho, westward ho, and eastward ho. The quote is, even society as a whole, a nation or all existing societies put together are not owners of the earth. They are merely its occupants, its users, and like good caretakers, they must hand it down improved to subsequent generations. Marx, Capital, Volume 1. The second is the sober reflection of Guy Debord in his The Society of the Spectacle, which explains why using economics and trying to figure out if the cost of sustainability or renewable energy technologies will ever be worth it is fallacious. He says, quote, in this world, which is so respectful of economic necessities, no one really knows the real cost of anything which is produced. In fact, the major part of the real cost is never calculated and the rest is kept secret to board the Society of the Spectacle. 
Political ecology in general, and liberation ecology in particular, uses the powerful tools of discourse theory to analyze what it is about our cultural interpretations of how best to live within nature and its resource and regenerative limitations that make us choose the paths we do, and most importantly, how the way we discuss them either encourages us to create problems or solutions. Discourse theory reminds us that, quote, concerned with a limited range of objects, a discourse emphasizes some concepts at the expense of others, end quote. Just as we have no choice and can't fill our gas tanks in the U.S. with methanol or ethanol or natural gas or biogas or hydrogen or DME or electrons as consumers in Brazil and Germany and Costa Rica and Hungary can, because these options are simply not present in America, we can't begin to discuss drawdown solutions if they've been left out of the discourse. U.S. education definitely emphasizes some concepts at the complete expense of others. Instead of inviting you to explore the entire worldwide web of solutions, they foreclose them. Even the World Bank a generation ago acknowledged that the top-down, tell the people what they need to know to fix things approach hasn't worked, because it will always leave the best local ideas out and disempower people and disincentivize them. The World Bank wrote, quote, the post-independence development efforts failed because the strategy was misconceived. Governments made a dash for modernization, copying but not adapting Western models. And this top-down approach demotivated ordinary people whose energies most needed to be mobilized in the development effort. The strategy, after independence, failed because it was based on poorly adapted foreign models. The vision was couched in the idiom of modernization. In recent years, however, many elements of this vision have changed, the World Bank said. Alternative paths have been proposed. They give primacy to agricultural development and emphasize not only prices, markets, and private sector activities, but also capacity building, grassroots participation, decentralization, and sound environmental practices. The time has come to put them fully into practice. That's a statement from the World Bank from 1989. Keep in mind that this perspective is similar to what the British economist E.F. Schumacher learned and championed when the British Coal Board, for whom he worked, sent him east to Burma in 1955. The former fossil fuel pundit was completely transformed. It's worth considering his story from originally being a German pro-Nietzsche graduate student in economics at Oxford who had been suspected of being a Nazi sympathizer during the war and confined to work as a laborer on an English farm, to then becoming the author of Small is Beautiful, Economics as if People Mattered, and the creator of the appropriate technology movement. And it's worth looking at his story because it illustrates how you, as a curious intellectual who dares to get your hands dirty and get your hands on learning, can become a leader in sustainability. At Oxford, as a graduate student, Schumacher wrote paper after paper on the economics of war, the Egyptian currency, multilateral clearing, and the Keynes plan for the post-war international system. When the opportunity arose, he plunged into planning the British post-war welfare state alongside its creator, William Beveridge. Returning to Germany in 1945, he was deeply shaken by what he saw, the destruction, the death and disease, the unraveling of a modern civilization his own family enmeshed in it all. His brother had died on the Russian front, and his physicist brother-in-law, Werner Heisenberg, was being secretly taken to England to be held and interrogated by the Allies in the English countryside. The dislocated Schumacher spent several years working on denazification and German economic reconstruction before returning in 1950 to England to become the economist of the National Coal Board. It could have been the dullest of sinecures, but it in fact marked the beginning of a remarkable period of personal transformation, for it was here, of all places, that Schumacher began to question the modern world. The article tells us, by day, he worked at one of the world's largest firms, protecting and promoting the fossil fuels on which English industry had been built. However, by night, so to speak, he discovered the emerging organic movement and cultivated his own garden. He discovered Gurdjieff and the Fourth Way, and immersed himself in the study of Buddhism and Eastern spirituality. As with everything he had ever done, he applied himself with zeal. These experiences, quote, 
led Schumacher to a life-changing visit to Burma in 1955, and it was in Burma that he was confronted with the cultural impact of Western economic development and was prompted to write his landmark Buddhist economics essay. This in turn allowed him to become a new voice in contemporary debates on economic development and modernity and to begin writing the essays that would become Small is Beautiful in 1973. I remember reading Schumacher's Small is Beautiful when I was in college and thinking that the most interesting phrase was when he said, we went to the East to try to teach them something about how to run the economy. And he said, but I realized that we have very little, if anything, to teach them and they have very, very much to teach us. Schumacher's insistence on considering the proper use of primary goods in relation to secondary goods was actually key to Paul Hawkins' work on natural capital that ultimately led to Project Drawdown. Schumacher made the argument that you never use your savings account, capital stock, natural capital, for activities that incur recurring costs. He reserved that for income. So he said, just as you don't dip into your savings account, which you reserve to send your kids to college to buy groceries or get a haircut, nor should we be dipping into our fossil reserves to drive to the supermarket or mow the lawn. A lot of drawdown is about matching the right or appropriate technologies to the task in terms of its relation to sources of capital. Now, since the East, at the time Schumacher was living there, was perceived to have a surplus of labor relative to technological capital, many of the solutions he championed were at a very human scale and a home scale. And as a result, later generations caught up in modernity have rejected these simple solutions, preferring to emulate the apparent push-button simplicity of mechanization. But it really isn't about the technology per se, it's about the attitude we use when we design, develop, and use technology. For example, in the early 2000s, the Cooper Hewitt Design Museum in New York hosted an influential exhibit and published a book called Design for the Other 90%, challenging the Global North designers to stop focusing exclusively on wealthy clients who crave sexy furniture and lamps and appliances and iPhones and fashionable clothes and instead consider designing for the rest of humanity who really need solutions to problems in food, energy, water, and sanitation and affordable housing. It worked as far as it went, but it still increased the gulf between the creative global north producers and the disempowered global south consumers. It was still giving a man a fish. And try as they might, designers from wealthy economies really could never put themselves in the shoes of those they were trying to design for. That was the point Ivan Illich was making in one of our lectures. A few years later, recognizing this, the museum changed its exhibit and its publications to designing with the other 90%, and that made all the difference. In fact, according to the 2011 article, Schumacher meets Schumpeter, Appropriate Technology Below the Radar, in the journal Research Policy, the other 90% really don't need the Global North to do any designing for and or with them at all. The article states, quote, Innovation and technological change play an important role in poverty reduction through their contribution to growth, their use of factors of production, their environmental spillovers, the social relations associated with production, and the characteristics of the products which they produce. It was only after the 1960s that these linkages were identified with the recognition that much of global technological progress was directed to meet the needs of the global rich and was best suited to operation in high-income environments. The development and diffusion of appropriate technologies was an agenda largely pursued by the not-for-profit appropriate technology movement. However, with the global diffusion of innovative capabilities and the rapid rise of incomes of the very poor, the second bottom billion, innovation for the poor and innovation appropriate for production in low-wage and poor infrastructure environments has increasingly become an arena for profitable production. The very large size of China and India, coupled with their growing technological capabilities and the rapid growth of low incomes, makes it likely that they will become the dominant sources of innovation for the poor." End quote. In other words, so long and thanks for all the fish, but basically we can teach our own people to fish from now on, thank you very much. This speaks to why drawdown solution number six is educating girls. And drawdown number 62 is women small holders. After all, that is the other 50% right there. 
east, west, north, south, when we give women the chance to design for themselves, they have certainly proven they don't need men to do things for them. And they, as Bunker Roy showed us at Barefoot College, can do an awful lot to help men and everybody who matters to them, their families, their villages, their towns, cities, and societies. Schumacher and those who followed him into political ecology and political economy, as if people mattered, recognized that what was most appropriate was that everyone had a stake and was given the dignity to make their own contribution. The primary directive is ethical. Do no harm. Respect one another. Respect all life. Do unto others. The golden rule. Apply those and the rest of the drawdown solutions actually just follow logically. Liberated to think for ourselves. To think both inside the box and outside the box. To expand our boxes to include not just the other 90%, not just the 100% of humanity, but 100% of all living symbiotic co-evolving beings. We got this. It's what nature of the capital N, nature that includes human nature and all non-human natures, does. It's tempting to think we richer, better, educated, more politically powerful humans can invent or policy make our way out of climate change. But without considering the mentality that led us to dependency on the destructive and polluting technologies and techniques and socio-political and economic structures that caused it would be a blunder. As Einstein so famously warned us, we can't solve problems by using the same kind of thinking we used when we created them. The article on Schumacher that I'm reading from, published by the Center for New Economics on Buddhist Economics, by Robert Leonard, a professor of history at the University of Quebec, shows how the Eastern perspective, really a Buddhist perspective, devoid of the Global North's interpretation of Genesis positing a God who encourages humanity to feel separate from and subdue and dominate nature while thinking only of his own multiplication, has informed postmodern, post-colonial sustainability thought and a new economic thought at the same time Schumacher repudiated fossil fuels in the 1960s and 70s and can continue to do so now when we all have to get rid of them stat. He writes, quote, although Schumacher did not become a Buddhist himself, his experience among Buddhists opened up the spiritual vista that shaped his economic thinking thereafter. The essential idea was simple and had already been stated by Gandhi, for whom Schumacher had the greatest admiration. It was also implicit in the work of others he read carefully, including Jacques Maritain and traditionalist writers René Guénon, Fritjof Schuon, and Ananda Kumaswamy. It said that humans must restrain their economic appetites by some combination of ethical or spiritual beliefs or some form of humility, failing which they would eventually strip the world of its resources and natural beauty. Many are reaching a similar conclusion today. My article shows how Schumacher was led to it some 70 years ago, end quote. By going through this course, it is hoped that you are also ready, like the acolyte in the 70s television show Kung Fu, to snatch the pebble of enlightenment from our hands and begin the deeper journey towards liberation ecology and an economics as if people and other beings mattered. You are now knighted a fellow liberator of those salutary ecologies that are going to literally save our planet, freeing the forces of human and non-human nature to work together toward sustainability. Welcome aboard. Your journey doesn't end with the conclusion of this introduction to the political ecology of climate change mitigation and adaptation and drawdown solutions. Your journey of a thousand steps begins with this first step that you've taken. Your journey begins here. So go east this time, young woman, and don't stop. Wherever you happen to be on earth right now, do as the Beatles song suggests and follow the sun. On a spherical planet, what goes around comes around, and if we're smart about it, it will be in a good way. Look always toward the sunrise, and move steadily toward that horizon, toward the dawn of a new era. Go to the light. That way lies not just climate mitigation and adaptation, but true sustainability. With liberty and justice for all.